Welcome to our webinar, Reducing Cravings for Substances by Balancing Blood Glucose with the Culturally Appropriate Version of the Mediterranean Diet. My name is Maxine Henry, the co-director for the National Hispanic and Latino Addiction Technology Transfer Center. Before I introduce you to today's guest presenter, here are some brief instructions about today's webinar. Next slide, please. This webinar will be recorded and archived for future playback. It will also be dubbed or closed captioned in Spanish and eventually also in Portuguese. A copy of today's presentation will also be made available after the webinar. The PDF of this presentation will also include recipes in both English and Spanish. The lines will be muted throughout the presentation so as to minimize background noise and other in interference. When we get to the Q&A portion of our webinar, you will have an opportunity to ask questions by clicking the Q&A box and I will present your questions to our presenter. We will also be asking you to fill out a brief survey at the end of this webinar. This satisfaction evaluation is important to the work we do and provides us the opportunity to improve our training efforts. Although we did not secure continuing education credits for this event, we plan to do so for future events. A certificate of completion can be sent to you upon request via email after the completion of our satisfaction evaluation. So let's begin. Next slide, please. Let us start by introducing the National Hispanic and Latino Addiction Technology Transfer Center and our team. <clears throat> Excuse me. The National Hispanic and Latino Addiction Technology Transfer Center is housed at the National Latino Behavioral Health Association located in New Mexico. NALBA was established to fill a need for a unified national voice for Latino populations in the behavioral health arena and to bring attention to the great disparities that exist in the areas of access, utilization, practice-based research, and adequately trained personnel. The NALBA's executive director is Frer Sandoval. Our ATTC is a part of the ATTC network, which is an international multidisciplinary resource for professionals in the addictions, treatment, and recovery services field. Next slide, please. Established in 1993 by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA, the ATTC network is comprised of 10 domestic regional centers, six international HIV centers funded by PEPFAR, two national focus area centers, and a network coordinating office. Together, the network serves the 50 US states, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, the US Virgin Islands, and the Pacific Islands of Guam, American Samoa, Palau, the Marshall Islands, Micronesia, and the Marina Islands. The international HIV ATTCs serve Vietnam, Southeast Asia, South Africa, and Ukraine. Here you will see a map of the US-based ATTCs. The National Hispanic and Latino ATTC has a national focus for Hispanic and Latino communities and the workforce that provides services to these communities. Next slide, please. Our ATTC is staffed by Dr. Pierre Luigi Mancini, our project director, I serve as the project co-director, and Ruth Yanez is our executive administrative assistant. The National Latino Behavioral Health Association, or NALBA, is also the home of our sister TTC, the National Hispanic and Latino Prevention Technology Transfer Center. We will provide contact information at the end of this webinar. Next slide, please. Our esteemed presenter for today is Jacqueline Villalobos, N.D. Dr. Villalobos is a Latina with deep roots in the New Mexico, Texas, Chihuahua border area. In her work as a holistic healer, she has primarily served underserved populations. For 15 years, she worked with migrant and seasonal farm workers in Western Oregon as a primary care provider for Virginia Garcia Memorial Health Center, offering culturally relevant healthcare and nutrition education. Four years ago, she returned to the desert Southwest where her passion to empower people through nutrition and lifestyle education is shared with people with autism spectrum disorders, as well as people in recovery from substance use. She also commits her time and energy to promoting the profession of naturopathic medicine, 
She served as nutrition chair for the Naturopathic Physicians Licensing Exam for 10 years. She is currently the chairwoman of the New Mexico Medical Board Naturopathic Doctors Advisory Council, which will regulate the newly licensed profession of naturopathic doctors in the state of New Mexico. She is a contributing journalist to the Las Cruces Sun News and offers free nutrition education in Las Cruces, New Mexico. Her passion and energy are recharged at her farm in rural New Mexico, where she loves watching the light and shadows on the landscape and spending time with her family, her dogs, and her community. Dr. Villalobos, I cannot thank you enough for being here today and sharing this valuable information. I will pass it on to you now. Thank you, Maxine. It's an honor to participate and to share information with so many mental health professionals across the country. Um, my current passion and vocation is helping people in recovery improve their health and stay sober through nutrition. Um, there's a lot of good evidence that shows that folks who are in recovery are substance abuse disorder. There's a high prevalence of malnutrition. So people who are drinking and drugging instead of doing exercise and eating fruits and vegetables understandably don't have optimal nutrition. And when they go into recovery, the cravings for sugar are very prevalent and there can be a, um, there's a addiction and appetite both share brain and behavior processes. So part of helping people stay sober includes keeping their blood sugar balance and getting them good nutrition. There was a study done with a group of men in a 12-step program recovery center and one group received nutrition education and they received improved diet as part of their treatment program. And those who did receive the and the better diet stayed sober longer. They reported less cravings for alcohol and for sugar. In my work here in Las Cruces, New Mexico at a recovery program, I've had a nice experience with a fella I'll call Jake, who is about four months into his recovery program at an intensive outpatient rehab center. And um, Jake was really gung-ho about eating more fruits and vegetables. So he just did a couple of simple things like having avocado toast in the morning and having a salad with a can of tuna opened on it most afternoons. And after a couple of weeks, he reported to me that he felt a lot more even-tempered and didn't have the sugar cravings and actually didn't need to take naps anymore. So I'm so honored and pleased to see that the information I'm gonna be sharing with you today really makes a difference in the lives of people who are in recovery. I specifically mentioned balancing blood glucose because when the blood glucose, when there are broad fluctuations in blood glucose, People who experience blood sugar crashes and then spikes have similar feelings, similar biochemical responses that they have when they're experiencing the pleasure of their drug and then the withdrawal symptoms. And so to, to prevent that sort of confusion between food craving and drug craving, keeping blood sugar balanced is imperative. It also just helps people feel better. In this particular study, they were measuring the blood flow to certain parts of the brain, and they noticed that people who ate a high glycemic index diet, which means highly refined sugary foods, that into sugar quickly, they had quicker cravings the part of their brain that corresponds to um, hunger and cravings was triggered within an hour or two of eating. And they also had, down here at the bottom it mentions, they had increased hunger and selectively stimulated brain regions associated with reward and craving 
which is the time in the late postprandial, which is the time when the behavior about the next meal or what they're craving. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time discussing this whole blood sugar balance. And I'll reference high glycemic index and low glycemic index. High glycemic index equals something that spikes your blood sugar. So this graph on the vertical axis, that's blood sugar levels. The horizontal axis is time. And the different waves are blood sugar fluctuations. So let's look first at the red curve. Let's say a person has a meal at 7 a.m. and that meal is Fruity Pebbles, which is a pretty sugary meal. That Fruity Pebbles converts to sugar, that's a high glycemic index food, that converts to sugar immediately and it spikes the blood sugar. So sometimes within 30 minutes, the entire meal is now sugar in the bloodstream. And the body responds, there are pleasure centers that are feeling good with this, you know, oh yeah, I'm feeling good, I've got my hit of sugar. But that hit quickly is depleted, just like some fast acting drugs. And when insulin lowers the blood sugar by feeding the cells, as you see that red curve actually drops lower than it started. So the insulin sort of overcompensates and then you get a blood sugar crash. When the brain has had a whole lot of sugar on board and then suddenly it has no sugar, it experiences the same anxiety and cravings that any addictive substance promote. And so the person is often feeling trembly, irritable, sometimes sweaty, and absolutely craving their next dose of sugar. So that is how high glycemic index foods can promote the same sort of neurotransmitter behaviors that drugs of abuse promote or substances of abuse. So the more you get into less refined foods, so the yellow curve represents, they're still refined, but maybe there's a little bit of fiber, you know, like pasta, or actually white bread, white rice, and white pasta. Each of those has less than two grams of fiber per serving. And fiber is the key to making it a high quality carb. So as you can see, okay, that meal lasts a little bit longer. Maybe the blood sugar doesn't spike for maybe 60 to 90 minutes. And when it comes down one or two hours later, the crash isn't as low. However, it still does crash. And so probably a lot of you have experienced this. Maybe you have a simple carb in the morning like a bagel and some juice. In a couple of hours, you're crazy hungry. It's the craving. So the solution, the diet, the Mediterranean diet, which isn't really a diet, it's a lifestyle. The Mediterranean style of eating results in a much smoother increase in blood sugar. So it's a time release of sugar. Carbs all turn to sugar. So carbs like corn, whole grains like oats, even fruit and vegetables, those are carbohydrates. But when your body has to work really hard to get the sugar out of the food, because that carb is so wrapped up in fiber, then fiber is the time release factor of carbs. And you actually get to subtract the, car the fiber from the carb. So if you're trying to be on a low carb diet and you see that half a cup of beans is 15 grams of carbohydrate. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah, but seven of those grams are fiber. So you actually get to subtract the seven from 15. So you're really only spiking or elevating your blood sugar by eight grams of carbohydrate. And those eight grams have been released slowly over three or four hours. So you never get the, your brain doesn't receive the pleasure center sudden hit 
it gets a constant time release flow of glucose and it never experiences the crash. So you're not getting the drug hit, you're not getting the drug withdrawal with the Mediterranean diet, which is whole foods, high fiber. So let's go more into what the Mediterranean diet is. Some folks think pasta, but no, 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 no. It's not pasta unless, well, no, most pastas tend to be pretty refined. The Mediterranean diet is whole foods. It's this picture here, real grains. You know, this picture does show some bread and you can have a little bit of the naughty stuff Maybe 20% of what a person eats can be whatever they feel like. If they're getting about 80% of their food intake from food that existed 200 years ago, they're going to feel a lot better and get healthier and stay sober longer. So the Mediterranean diet, I'm going to borrow from the book that suggests that we eat foods that existed 200 years ago mostly plants. That's a great way to sum it all up. Eat whole, unrefined foods, mostly plants. Shooting for five to nine servings a day of fruits and vegetables. A serving of pretty much everything is about half a cup. And when you have grains, that they be whole grains like oats or brown rice or quinoa or eating legumes. The Mexican tradition of beans and lentejas, lentils, is an excellent food source that is such a power food. Raw seeds and nuts, like sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds, they're cheap and they're so good for us. High quality oils like olive oil, non-GMO canola oil, maybe a little coconut oil, avocado is an excellent fat. If you eat animal foods, then just keep it simple, unprocessed meats, chicken, fish, small servings, more of the polyunsaturated fat and less of the saturated fat, and wild caught fish and seafood. So that's, uh, in a nutshell, so to speak, that's the Mediterranean diet. Some folks think it's not achievable because it's too expensive, but like with Jake, if he, he made simple changes, and this is part of what I teach at the recovery center, start with buying some frozen vegetables, frozen fruits. That way, if you're not yet in the habit of eating plenty of fruits and vegetables, they're not going to rot in the refrigerator. I hate to waste food. So eating frozen fruits and vegetables, um, foods like cabbage, carrots, onion, garlic, those are superfoods and they last a really long time. Buying bulk beans, um, bulk oats, bulk barley, bulk raw seeds, pum pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds, canned fish like tuna, sardines, salmon, and then, you know, buying the family pack of meat and I like to suggest that people break it up into single serving units and freeze it that way so that they can use it as they, as they need it. So these are helpful tips so that folks can start making these changes and it doesn't break the bank and they're not wasting food. Other helpful be eating cocoa puffs for breakfast, which a lot of the, the folks I work with at the recovery center do um, they do eat cereal for breakfast. I suggest, okay, just maybe can you eat Cheerios multigrain instead? Or just add some pumpkin seeds to your cereal and cut up an apple or add some of those frozen mixed berries so that you're gradually introducing more whole foods to your existing processed food. If you eat cup of soup every day, all right, eat your cup of soup, but how about a bag of frozen mixed vegetables and combine it with your cup of soup? So there's a little bit of veggie going in there with your cup of soup. And eventually you'll get to the point where you'll eat more vegetables and less cup of soup. Um, adding veggies to beans, any kind, just adding fruit, veggies, seeds, nuts to what you're already in the habit of eating. If you're in the habit of a sandwich, 
load it up with a bunch of spinach and sliced apples or sliced cucumber, or, you know, a little bit of jalapeno, guacamole. There's, there's ways to healthy up less healthy food. And that's sort of the continuum moving from highly refined foods to healthier foods. I'm gonna point out some of my favorite fruits and vegetables because they're the stuff that helps to restore health the strongest. Like berries actually help to balance blood sugar. And frozen mixed berries are a great way to make your oatmeal better. They also improve the health of the blood vessels. So a lot of folks who have been using heroin have a risk of more aneurysms, aortic aneurysm, is a um, long-term sequelae of heroin abuse. So these purple fruits help to strengthen the blood vessel walls to prevent aneurysms. Vitamin C rich foods are a big part of Mexican food like pineapple and oranges and papaya. And so, you know, fruit salad with a little bit of chili powder and lime is a favorite. Expensive. Vitamin C is also really important antioxidant for helping to repair the damage that has been done with substances. The green leafy vegetables are also superfoods because they're loaded with the B vitamins and they also lend themselves nicely to being mixed with beans. It's gotten to the point where anytime I make beans, I throw in some kind of greens. Um, cilantro, you know, my grandma used to make quelites, which was purslane, a little weed that grows out here in the desert southwest, which, by the way, is very high in omega-3 fatty acids. And so she would cut up some purslane, tomato, onion, jalapeno, and mix it with beans, and that was quelites. So it's not uncommon to use greens. And so I just remind folks, throw some greens in anytime you make beans and plenty of it so it's 50 50. there's going to be a recipe for beans and greens cilantro which is a wonderful mexican green is unique in that it helps remove heavy metals from the bloodstream um, mercury specifically so each of these foods has its wonderful magic medicine and you don't really need to know what those roles are, just eat the food. The bright orange vegetables are high in, in vitamin A and zinc, which are really important for restoring lung health, immune health, their cofactors and neurotransmitters. And, you know, something like sweet potato, that was something that we used to eat when I was a child. A glass of milk with some camote, with sweet potato and a little cinnamon. It's, it's comfort food, it's good for you. These are the ways that I invite people to return to their ancestral traditions, even while they're eating the Mediterranean diet. Add carrots to your soup. If you're gonna have an empanada, have a pumpkin empanada. It's less naughty than a cherry, but it seems to be a lot of sugar. The cruciferous vegetables, the cabbage family, are such potent gut healing foods. They also help to detoxify, their, they prevent breast cancer, and cabbage is cheap, and it keeps for a long time in the refrigerator. So coleslaw is a cheap, great food to eat. I like to make coleslaw with little green onions, which are high in selenium, and cilantro, which detoxifies a little vinegar and oil, and it's easy peasy and delicious. And then of course, salsa. All the vegetables that go into salsa are some of the most potent healing vegetables. Garlic and onions are kind of like antibiotics, and they're also sulfur containing, so they help heal the liver. All of the sulfur containing foods, including avocado, help to heal the damage to the liver. Avocado, nopalitos. Nopalitos help to balance blood sugar. There's actually studies that show that people who eat nopalitos have better outcomes with their diabetes. Green beans also help balance blood sugar. As I mentioned, 
avocado, beets also help heal the liver. Anytime a person has been abusing substances, their liver is taken a toll. And the joy is that we can help repair our liver by first removing that which causes the damage and then providing the building blocks to repair the body. This slide has a whole lot of information about vitamin C, which is present in fruits and vegetables. And so that's just there for your information. But did you know, for instance, that spinach has vitamin C or broccoli has vitamin C? So it's not just in fruits. A lot of the whole glycemic index that we looked at in the graph was grains. So this is what I mean when I say whole, unrefined grains. The pictures you see here, the larger background pictures are steel cut oats and then rolled oats. Those both have plenty of fiber, about three to five grams of fiber per serving. The little balls are quinoa, in the middle is barley, which I love to throw barley into soups instead of rice, instead of noodles, because it's a really excellent source of some amino acids and minerals. And then the other grain is rye. So I've mentioned some of these nutrients. Some of the minerals like selenium and zinc are present in grains. That's part of why I'm not a big fan of the keto diet that completely excludes grains because grains uniquely provide high levels of some of the minerals that we need. Another good source of selenium, which selenium is an antioxidant that helps to repair any damage to the body, including the liver. Little green onions are loaded with selenium and they're cheap. So little green onions, cilantro and cabbage, that's a good meal. Legumes, high in protein, they're cheap, way cheaper than meat. They mix well with vegetables, something like a you know, like chili beans, but with a whole lot of bell peppers and tomatoes and onions. And eat I even suggest to people to throw a bag of frozen mixed vegetables into their chili beans. Likewise, anytime I'm making pea soup, lentil soup, I do 50-50 veggie, which might be the cheap stuff like onions, garlic, carrots, celery, spinach. 50% veggie, 50% legume. And spice it up with comino, red chili powder, so that they're flavors that we all recognize, they're ingredients we all recognize, the ratio is changed so that it makes it that much healthier. Here are pictures of the best sources of oils, our plant-based oils, like avocado seeds, um, the little tiny seeds next to the sunflower are flax seeds, which I love because if you buy them in bulk whole, they're about maybe $1.50 a pound, and they're super high in omega-3 fatty acids, which help to heal the brain. Pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds are high in zinc and omega-3 fatty acids, and they're cheap and readily available and they go well on a salad. They're good for a handful of seeds and an apple for a snack. Each of these seeds and nuts provides omega-3 fatty acids, but it also, each seed and nut has its area of strength. Like pumpkin seeds are particularly good for prostate or bladder. Um, almonds lower blood pressure. Pecans and walnuts are really great for brain health. But whichever ones are readily available, inexpensive, that's the one to use because they're all going to benefit. The B vitamins are another really important nutrient to consider because they're important for detoxification in the liver and they're important for the production of dopamine, serotonin, acetylcholine, tyrosine, tryptophan, all of the neurotransmitters that help keep our brain healthy. And they're present in a lot of the seeds and nuts and in some of the grains. 
So a person doesn't have to go out and buy a vitamin if they're eating a nice variety of fruits and vegetables, seeds, nuts, legumes, and whole grains, and high quality proteins. Magnesium is another nutrient that not only is it relaxing to the muscles, it's, a, it's an important cofactor in the cytochrome P450 pathways of the liver that do most of the detoxifying in the liver. So magnesium is a very important nutrient for all of our health, but especially anyone who's had a substance use disorder and probably has burdened the liver. And as you can see, magnesium is also present in a lot of the seeds and nuts and grains, and even in some of the legumes like soybeans. Vitamin E is another of the antioxidants, A, C, and E, ACE, and they protect the liver. So it's there in almonds, asparagus, avocado, tomato, sunflower seeds. It's food that doesn't cost a fortune and is available to a lot of folks. Uh, the other day, one of my clients asked me what I thought about this particular energy drink with amino acids and the energy drink costs about $2. And I suggested, you know, those $2 would probably be better spent buying a bag of sunflower seeds or getting yourself, you know, $2 worth of chicken or uh, some eggs. So these are the kind of advice I give. Try and substitute real foods for the prepared foods that have become so much a part of people's lives. Zinc is another really important cofactor for um, neurotransmitter production and detoxifying. And you can see seeds and nuts and zinc. So here we have a polling question. The, is it imperative to know the food sources of specific nutrients to achieve a well-balanced diet? True or false? Okay. Okay, that's awesome. It's, it appears that about 70% of people think that it is true that you need to know the nutrient, uh, the specific nutrients in foods to achieve a well-balanced diet. And 28% thought that was false. Thank you for your input. I say it's not necessary to know what the source of vitamin C is. If the goal is to have a well-balanced diet. If a person is eating a variety of fruits and vegetables and having some grains and variety is the spice of life, then you don't really need to know what's in what. Just get a good variety of fruits and vegetables, seeds and nuts, whole grains, different kinds of proteins like eggs or chicken or fish or peas. Then you probably don't have to sweat the small stuff. So omega-3 fatty acids are very important for repairing nerve tissue and brain tissue because the brain and the nervous system is predominantly fat and you are what you eat. So eating high quality fats helps to produce high quality tissue. Good sources of omega-3 include all the seeds and nuts that we discussed. Flax is particularly high, so is chia. Both of them need to be ground to access the oils, but all of the seeds and nuts. And I mentioned raw seeds and nuts because once they're roasted, the omega-3 fats have been oxidized. So it's important to have raw seeds and nuts. Also oily fish like salmon, trout, the little cans of sardines or even canned tuna or canned salmon, that's fine as long as they're canned in water. And I also look for the ones that are sustainably harvested. Um, everyone's on a budget, so do what you can. 
Other high quality fats to produce good brains and nervous tissue include extra virgin olive oil, small amounts of oils, which by the way, extra virgin olive oil shouldn't be heated to the point of smoking, then it's turned into a carcinogen. Anytime an oil smokes, it's now carcinogenic. So use medium to low heat. Coconut oil is a good for you oil. It is saturated fat. Canola oil, raw seeds and nuts, fatty fish, avocado, better butter, which is butter mixed with olive oil. That's a good spread. Margarine and those kind of things produce bad nervous tissue. So you don't want fake fats. The real stuff, we wanna eat what existed 200 years ago. Eat animal products if that's okay with your, with your lifestyle. Have small servings, about three ounces. And as clean as possible, not processed meats, but real meat like beef, chicken, not uh, chicken, prepackaged chicken strips and not like lunch meat. That stuff has a lot of chemicals that contributes to neurotoxins. So just eating real food in the form that it was born. People who are vegetarian to make sure that they're getting plenty of amino acids, protein, can get their proteins from legumes, grains, seeds, nuts. And this chart, which when you download the PDF, you can um, blow up this chart and share it if you like. It's a good, it's got good information about how much protein you're getting per serving. Some of the proteins, the amino acids that we get in proteins are very important in recovery. Amino acids contribute to producing new neurotransmitters. They help to decrease cravings for drugs and sugar. They increase satiety. They help to restore good brain and nervous system tissue. And so here are some the sources of amino acids, which you're gonna notice that meat, you know, like beef, is at the top of the list of most of these amino acids that I'm pointing out. L-carnitine is an amino acid. I, I suggest people not to take supplements of amino acids if their liver or kidney function is at all compromised because there can be problems. So get it from food. Beef provides carnitine, which helps to improve cognitive function that is sometimes lost with chronic alcohol abuse and other substance use. Glutamine is an amino acid available in cabbage. I love cabbage because of glutamine. One of the remedios that I learned before I was even a naturopathic doctor, I learned it from a curandera in Juarez, was about cabbage juice for ulcers. And the, the data shows that the glutamine in cabbage is one of the most important amino acids for healing intestinal and gastrointestinal tissue. So it does indeed help to restore a, a damaged stomach or small intestine or colon. So when the lining of the intestines has been damaged by eating fake food or using drugs or having too much ibuprofen or alcohol, cabbage is a great remedy. It also reduces cravings and it's cheap. Here are some other sources of glutamine, meat, cheese, asparagus, broccoli. Another, so choline is not an amino acid. It's kind of like a B vitamin, but it's high in um, it, acetylcholine, you know, one of the neurotransmitters that's produced right there next to dopamine. So it's important to eat choline rich foods so that you're producing healthy acetylcholine and N acetylcholine and, um, which is important for brain function. And choline also helps bile production and it helps to reverse fatty liver disease. A lot of folks who have experienced alcohol use disorder have alcoholic 
fatty liver disease, and choline and vitamin E help to reverse fatty liver disease. So as you can see, it's present in, there's that darn beef again, beef liver, salmon, chickpeas, so garbanzo beans, which are not uncommon in the Mexican kitchen, split peas, eggs, turkey, there are sources of choline. Tryptophan is another amino acid. Probably many of you have experienced the effects of tryptophan on Thanksgiving after eating all that yummy tryptophan rich turkey, you get the turkey coma. It's not just the sound of the football game in the background, it truly is the tryptophan in the turkey that raised your serotonin levels and helped you to feel like you needed a nice nap. So a lot of the antidepressants that are being prescribed and even some of the, you know, like the SNRIs, they're relying on altering your tryptophan. So eating tryptophan rich foods helps people feel satisfied. Um, there are some medications and actually even some supplements that are versions of tryptophan for people who are trying to lose weight because it helps you feel full. It reduces cravings for sugar and it raises serotonin levels, which help people feel happier. By the way, serotonin, a lot of serotonin is produced in the gut. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. So we've talked about the Mediterranean diet and I've hopefully given you some ways to incorporate the principles of the Mediterranean diet into a traditional Latino diet. The polling question now, does it make sense to you? Do you think the Mediterranean diet is practical and affordable for Latinos in recovery? Hooray! I'm so glad to see that 78% of you said yes. 4% said no, and 17% said, I don't know. Thank you, thank you, thank you for responding to that. In my work as a, um, as a doctor of naturopathic medicine at a clinic that served migrant farm workers and seasonal workers, it was awesome to see that simple, humble folks were able to eat more vegetables because they could always have more tomatoes and more salsa. And they, and they resonated with the idea of chicken soup with a bunch of veggies or huevos a la mexicana with a bunch of veggies and frijoles instead of a bunch of tortillas. So I saw it in action among some of the most marginalized and lowest socioeconomic um, strata folks in the country. And I'm here to tell you, it really is achievable. So we've been talking about balancing blood sugar as a way to help people stay sober. And I've also been talking a lot about repairing the damage that the substance use disorder has caused. And I wanna share a story of a client recently. Um, he came to me in October with ulcerative colitis. So this isn't about substance use disorder, it's about how food can heal the body. So ulcerative colitis, esophagitis, gastritis, and there were ulcers in the esophagus and ulcers in the stomach lining and ulcers in the duodenal lining. So he wanted to see if maybe nutrition could help. All of these ulcers had been seen by an upper GI that was done in October. So he went on a whole foods diet and we communicated about every couple of weeks so I could 
you know, tell them, oh no, that does, nope, that's not Whole Foods. Yeah, that's Whole Foods. And yeah, how about try this? So anyway, with some coaching, he changed to a Whole Foods diet and he avoided the foods he was sensitive to. Those were the two things he did. There were no supplements. Um, and he also ate on a regular basis. So he made sure never to skip meals. He ate breakfast, lunch, dinner, mostly plants and animal products. The guy's a hunter, so he had access to venison and stuff. In December, the upper GI was repeated at the cancer center because his ulcerations were so severe that the gastroenterologist was afraid that he was having pre cancerous conditions. So in three months of eating a whole foods diet, the ulcerations resolved in the esophagus, in the duodenum, and in the stomach. There was still a little bit of inflammation, but the ulcerations had resolved. The tissue healed in three months. We had pictures of a before and after. Our bodies are so amazingly resilient. If we remove the cause and provide building blocks for the body to do what it knows how to do, if you just get out of its way, give it high quality foods, eat on a regular basis, plenty of fruits and vegetables, seeds and nuts, the body will restore itself. High quality dietary fats, and protein, stabilize blood sugar, build healthier brain and body tissue, and feed the microbiome. So just eating the right foods does indeed restore health, and it helps people stay sober longer too. I mentioned the microbiome. So it's one of the areas of my greatest interest lately. There's new research that shows that the microbiome is a description of all of the microbes, bacteria, protozoa, fungi, amoeba, that live in our GI tract. There are trillions of, of microbes that inhabit our GI tract, and they're an integral part of our physiology. There's new research that shows that the microbes are affecting blood sugar, blood pressure, um, the nervous system, inflammation, the blood brain barrier. This diagram here is just a kind of, all the little guys on the bottom, the, the gut microbiota. That represents the bacteria, the bugs inside the intestines. Those are intestinal cell walls. In the middle, you see a disrupted cell wall because normally our intestines have a very tight junction. The cell walls are a tight junction. They keep bad guys out and they absorb, selectively they absorb what the body needs. When there's been chronic irritation and inflammation, that junction starts to get a little boggy and then the cells start to separate. This is what you may have heard of leaky gut syndrome or impaired intestinal permeability. That's what you see in the middle there. So when there is chronic inflammation and irritation, not only does it physically affect the lining of the intestines, it affects the balance of the microbiome. If there's an inflammatory diet or an inflammatory lifestyle, we produce more bugs or we're feeding more of the bugs that promote inflammation and promote anxiety and promote depression and diabetes and hypertension. So there's actually direct communication between these micro these microbes and the brain via, via the vagus nerve. So as I mentioned earlier, serotonin is produced not only in the brain, it's produced in the gut. And 
these gut bugs are important mediators of serotonin production. If there is inflammation in the gut, there's more cortisol or adrenaline or stress hormone. It generalizes to the whole body. So what's happening in the gut happens all over the body. If there's, now hear this, this is very important. If there is impaired intestinal permeability, there's corresponding impaired blood-brain barrier permeability. And so people's brains become more subject to the damage caused by neurotoxins. As we repair the gut, the blood-brain barrier also improves. So healing the gut and addressing the microbiota is an integral part of helping people get healthy and stay sober. Dysbiosis, which means imbalanced gut bugs, has a direct effect increasing depression, anxiety, social isolation, pessimism, mental fogginess, inflammation, a lot of the symptoms that people are experiencing when they're using substances and in recovery. There was a study done about the microbiome and eating disorders, which is a common comorbidity with substance use disorder are eating disorders. And there did appear to be a correlation with impaired um, gut bugs and eating disorders. So if we can help people's microbiome to become more balanced, we can actually even help the symptoms of eating disorders. This study discusses um, it's a meta-analysis, and the bottom line is folks who were experiencing depression, when they used a probiotic, and it's important to use high-quality probiotics, by the way, um, when they used probiotics, their depression scores were lower. You can also improve the gut microbiota, not just by supplementing probiotics, but by eating prebiotic foods, which I'll give you more information about in a minute. As I mentioned, intestinal permeability or leaky gut. They did in this study, they found that those people who were in a recovery program who had, they tested positive for more intestinal permeability, they tended to have more alcohol cravings and more blood glucose imbalances. At the bottom, I've highlighted that the results of this study suggest that the existence of the gut-brain access in alcohol dependence, which implicates the gut microbiota as an actor in the gut barrier and in behavioral disorders. Thus, the gut microbiota seems to be a previously unidentified target in the management of alcohol dependence. So how do you heal it? Guess what? The Mediterranean diet. This is the beauty of food. If you eat the right food and remove the foods that cause the inflammation, you feed the right bugs. So eating a plant-based diet helps to encourage the growth of those microbes like lactobacillus acidophilus that you get in yogurt or bifido bulgaris, which a lot of Latinos have heard about bulgaros back on the farm Grandma would use bulgaros to turn the milk into yogurt. So that's, they've been making their fermented foods for millennia as well. So just sticking with a plant-based diet helps to heal intestinal lining and it helps to improve the balance of the microbiome. These foods are uniquely prebiotic. They're not probiotics. They're prebiotic, sorry for the typo there. They promote the growth of the good bugs. So yogurt, but a high quality yogurt, not just like the grocery stores brand of, you know, orange marmalade yogurt. That tends to be a pretty high sugar food. Rather, 
uh, a Greek yogurt, if they can afford it, plain, unsweetened. Some of the brands that do have the, the live culture include like Nancy's yogurt, and it is more expensive, but if, or if they know anyone who makes yogurt, there's that too. Garlic, onions, leeks, the gut bugs love that family of foods. Barley, flax, oats, beans. So see, this is the cheap stuff. This is not fancy, it's not expensive. And it's the kind of thing that a lot of Latinas are eating every day. Garlic and onions, oats, beans, cabbage, artichokes, maybe not so common, but a lot of folks know alcachofas. They love artichokes with a little bit of lemon juice, numbs, red chili powder, lemon and red chili makes everything better. So in this case, I do suggest if you're gonna buy a supplement, let it be probiotics and a high quality probiotic. One of the brands that's available in many health food stores is Garden of Life. They have good live culture. So that is pretty much what, what I wanted to share. Having the Mediterranean diet, which is the beauty of the Mediterranean diet is it's kind of a high fat diet. 30% of calories from fat, five to nine servings of fruits and vegetables a day, eating seeds or nuts just about every day, eating legumes like frijolitos three to five times a week. And if you go over that, no big deal. Serving sizes about half. And high quality fats like olive oil, non-GMO canola, coconut oil, small servings of whole grains like oats, barley, quinoa, brown rice. I um, suggest to people to try quinoa, mixing it with white rice 50-50 and gradually substitute it. And then they can have their white, their like Spanish rice made with quinoa instead of white rice. And then small servings of meat. So in addition to what we eat, it's important that we entrain our digestion to optimize digestive function by eating on a regular schedule. So eating three meals a day, eating mindfully, gratefully, taking a few deep breaths, which puts you into parasympathetic, so you're actually going to digest better, and it's just good for your mind and body. So three meals a day, slowly, gratefully, mindfully. Move your body every day exercise, you know, even going for a walk, playing basketball, whatever, play soccer, just move your body. You all probably know about the antidepressant effects of exercise. Sleep is imperative. Getting six to eight hours of sleep at night because we're not nocturnal creatures and our circadian rhythms, we will restore health when we get back to what humans were meant to do, which is Eat three times a day, be outside, move your body, sleep when it's dark. That's what humans have been doing for millennia. Drink water, manage stress. There's a very cool study that was done. I invite you to go to their website, wild5wellness.com. It was um, measuring the impact of a five-pronged, which included a 30-day wellness program um, on people's moods and mindfulness using sleep, mindfulness, exercise, nutrition, and social connectedness. And there were statistically significant improvements in the areas of depression, anxiety, um, and then some of the other mental health scores. People also found that the nutrition changes were amongst the easiest to accomplish. Staying connected and the nutrition changes were those that were rated as the most, yeah, I could do that. So check out that study, it's pretty cool. The staying connected piece is a really important part of 12 steps. And I love this picture with cutie patootie here, calling and chatting it up. So, you know, anytime we're reminded that we're, we're part of the fellowship of humankind, it helps us to take better care of ourselves. Exercising is very important to mental health. It's antidepressant. 
it reduces anxiety, it helps sleep. As you know, a lot of folks who have been abusing substances have sleep problems and exercise is a great help, but especially in the morning, no exercise at night, it ramps you up too much. There's a little slide about um, I'll let you read that later. And so in general, we want to commit to a lifestyle that restores balance. Sleeping every night, six to eight hours, moving our bodies, managing stress, eating what our ancestors ate, mostly plants, and staying engaged in life. There's a lot of new data that shows that isolation is almost as bad for us as smoking cigarettes. So restoring balance in recovery and helping people to stay sober can be significantly aided by sharing information about the Mediterranean diet so that folks are eating in a way that keeps their blood sugar balanced, it's providing nutrients to heal the body, and it helps remind them that they're part of the cycle of life. They're part of nature, the plants, the moon, the sun, and the human, we're all connected. And to the degree that we honor that connection by eating that which Mother Earth provides for us, we're gonna be healthier. That's what I've got for you today. Thank you all for your attention. And now we're gonna open to question and answers. Thank you so much, Dr. Villalobos. <clears throat> Excuse me, that presentation was phenomenal. Um, some of the pieces, you know, I was like, oh, I could eat frijoles, like that's amazing. Um, some of those, you know, more attainable foods that, that we often forget about in the hustle and bustle of everyday life. Um, so we have a couple of questions and I wanna remind everyone, since we are at the Q&A section, we do have a healthy amount of time to answer your questions. Um, so at the bottom center of your screen, there is a Q&A box. If you click on that, you can easily type your question there and we will do our best to answer all of the questions live. So Dr. Villalobos, our first question came a little early in your presentation from Destiny Eversoll. She asked, is this the same as decolonizing our diets? Huh, I've never heard that term, but um, it sounds good. As in colonizing, as in the, the colonialism and that. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that's what she means. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I didn't specifically address the ancestral diet, but as I mentioned to you earlier today, Maxine, it is a huge part of our restoring balance and restoring our connection to who we are and who our ancestors are is eat what your ancestors ate and so yes we latinos who have been on the north american continent wheat and milk weren't actually part of our ancestral diet until the spanish arrived so yeah eating legumes and plants you know yervitas and meat so i hope I'm understanding her question. And if I am, then I would say yes. Perfect. And if we aren't understanding your question correctly, Destiny, um, feel free to, to type in a follow-up question. And, and if we're not, we can try to get a little bit closer um, to what it is that you want answered. Um, so Kathy Dutridge asked, <clears throat> how can I help connect people's thoughts to let them know there is a connection with what they eat and how they feel. I face a real disconnect and hear frequently, that's just how things go in my family. Hmm. So one of the, the steps that I take to help people to make it real for them, the connection between what they eat and how they feel, is I give them some real simple advice like, okay, just for one week, have oatmeal with apples every day, have some chicken soup and vegetables every afternoon, have you know some frijolitos with spinach every evening. Just do it for one week and notice how you feel. And most people are willing to do it and they will feel better. They'll, they'll start feeling better within 48 hours. As soon as their blood sugar starts to stabilize, they start to feel better. 
And by the way, I also tell them, do this and don't do the other stuff you were used to doing. Okay, so that Snickers bar to follow up that, that um, soup is probably not a good idea. Right, but even if they do have the Snickers bar after the soup, they're still gonna feel better because all the fiber and fat in that soup is going to stabilize their blood sugar. Great, okay, great tip. Uh, so it's about slowly kind of getting back to this ancestral diet that we've had. Yeah. Great. Um, so Maria Amestoy asked, what about cheese in our diets? <laughs> oh, Maria, you've, you've pushed my button. So um, I'm a huge hater of dairy products. Many Latinos, many, many are lactose intolerant, and I'm doing air quotes right now, lactose intolerant. Um, because the dairy cow didn't come to North America until the Spanish arrived in the enzymes to digest not only lactose, which is the sugar in milk, but casein, which is the protein in milk. And so um, if you're lactose intolerant, if you drink a glass of milk and it makes your stomach hurt or causes any symptoms, I would suggest avoid all dairy products because you're not capable of digesting it well and it will keep you in a state of chronic inflammation. And you know how I was talking about impaired intestinal permeability. You must remove that which keeps you inflamed to allow the gut to heal. And so that's one of the bad, the pieces of bad news that I share with many of my clients is try getting off dairy if you want to improve your gut. Oh, okay. That's good to know. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think that at least for me, I have sometimes a misconception of what lactose intolerance means. So I think it, you know, it's definitely something that we could all at least try. What is it, you know, how do we feel if we stop eating as much cheese or as much dairy? Um, I did see ice cream on one of your lists of the good ones. It was a little lower on your list. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did include dairy on the lists because it's not evil for everyone, but if it's evil yes. for you, then you will heal much faster, not just eating less of it but completely eliminating it for a period of time to allow the tissue to heal. And then you can have it de vez en cuando, once in a while. Ah, okay. And, you know, so along this topic of things, for instance, like dairy, you know, now I think that we're finding a whole lot more because a lot of food allergies have really, you know, come to the attention, especially in schools. And, and, and so you're seeing more options in grocery stores. Yeah. So what are your thoughts about folks, for instance, going with the non-dairy ice cream option now? I mean, in our local grocery store, I was really surprised recently to find the avocado-based ice creams wow. um, and yeah. the coconut milk-based ice cream. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, but keep in mind, that's your 20%, 80-20, you know, 80% <laughs> This is the ideal. 80% of the time you're eating what existed 200 years ago. And 20% of the time you're having a darn piece of cake and some ice cream or whatever just makes you so happy and you love it. Don't waste your 20% on bad cookies. Get a really good cookie. And yes, there are some very delicious coconut milk ice creams. Of all the non-dairy ice creams, my favorite is coconut milk because it has really high quality fat and they tend to have less food-like substances. You know, they're just simpler yeah. ingredient. Um, but speaking of substitutes, many gluten-free products are very high glycemic index. So, you know, if anyone is following a gluten-free diet, caution, because gluten-free bread spikes your blood sugar as if you were eating white flour. I have, I've had a hard time finding a high fiber, simple ingredient, gluten-free bread. Ah, okay. So that's always good to know too, is what, what things are being substituted for. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so Maria Herrero wants to know, can we cook with avocado oil or grape oil? 
Um, yeah, avocado is very heat stable. Grape oil, um, and I have not done a lot of research on this, but my recollection about grape seed oil, it's an excellent oil, but best served cold. You'll get more of the polyphenols and the, you know, the medicine in the oil if you don't heat it. Likewise, flax seed oil, sesame seed oil, these oils are highly superior oils. They're loaded with all kinds of amazing medicine, but, and so they're best added at the end of the recipe when you've already taken the food off the stove. So that was flax, sesame, and grapeseed oil. Avocado oil is a good one for cooking. Yes, Maria. Perfect. Okay. So we have a, a, a mixed comment question from Cindy Olvina. Okay. Cindy says, I am the dietitian at a state addiction center. I have been giving my patients this information for a few years, but highly frustrated that while in recovery, these patients do not have access to food that promote the health of microbiome and blood sugars. This would require a shift in mindset of the state system, which still considers medication as the central focus of recovery. I actually did a presentation on this very topic to physicians. I had one MD ended up turning his back on me for the entire presentation. So the question is this, any suggestions on how to go about effectively delivering this message and actually affecting change? So it sounds more like at the, at the systems level, like how do we get these really kind of medic, you know, and, and medica medication assisted treatment is obviously, it works. Yeah. Um, some folks, you know, require additional services on top of that. And so not to discredit Matt, but how can we help physicians or other providers kind of see this as a complementary um, help or offer, you know, as this is a complementary solution mm -hmm. to recovery? So... I have a two prong answer. One is more of a policy level answer. Um, recently when we were seeking licensure for naturopathic medicine in New Mexico, we had the good fortune of forming alliances with people like Fred Sandoval, the director of um, the National Hispanic, como? NALBA, National Latino Behavioral Health Association. Yeah. And Fred is well connected in Santa Fe, our state capital. We also had the benefit of um, forming alliances with some physicians that were on the medical board who share the understanding that nutrition is imperative to save money in, um, in the medical system. And so we we made friendships and we, we had the advocacy of like-minded people in influential places. So that would be my first, um, from a policy perspective, my advice is to look for people who are uh, the decision makers and see what sort of uh, bills they've been supporting or see what committees they're sitting on so that you can, or you know, ask around, who, who here really will advocate for including nutrition in mental health? Because there's so much evidence about its effectiveness. And um, so that's on the policy level. As far as when you're dealing with physicians, um, just come to them with data because evidence is, you know, evidence-based information is what they respond to, what we respond to as healthcare providers. And so there's a lot of good data about the importance of, well, just today I was, I was looking at a UCLA neurology webinar on um, multiple sclerosis. And this neurologist at the end of her talk, talked about the human microbiome and uh, the amazing research on it. And I was thinking, all right, you go girl. So 
there are lots of, there's lots of, of um, evidence out there. Just find the evidence, look on reputable websites, you know, like NIH, um, and then speak to them in their language. And money talks. When you talk about prevention versus intervention, or, you know, like preventing relapse by improving nutrition. You can refer to one of the studies that I cited here. That's why I included some studies. Thank you. So it sounds like, um, you know, there are definitely be folks who might not ever kind of agree with this, but as long as we can work to find some allies that would definitely help us move in the right direction. And then of course, speaking their language talking about cost savings, talking about just kind of the enhancement of the um, solutions that they're already essentially funding would be a good, you know, a good place to start. Mm -hmm. And also talking about not instead of, but in addition to, which was mentioned in the question. That was, I think, how we were able to get the uh, advocacy of the New Mexico Medical Board. We said, how can we help you take care of the health of New Mexican citizens. Not like, yeah, we've got the answer and you don't, you know? It's like, it's not about being adversarial. We're, we're in an era where we're gonna get so much further with collaboration. Right, I agree with you. Um, so Nancy Hart has a question. She wants to know if you have any suggestions on adapting these for children. Many of the families that she works with are struggling with picky eaters that refuse to stop eating processed foods and foods high in dairy. And I think that this might also be connected, Dr. Villalobos, to this idea that folks in recovery typically, I mean, ideally wouldn't be by themselves, right? Like some of us in recovery live with a family. And so ideally we're making one meal Right, everybody at dinner. So, I mean, maybe we can answer not only with regard to children, but especially if, we, let's say, we have an adult or a parent in the household that's trying to use um, diet as as part of their sustaining recovery. How yeah. might we adapt this for the rest of the family, including children? Sure, sure. Well, so um, one of well, there are a couple of cheating kind of things, like little secret things, which is pureeing vegetables and adding that pureed vegetable into anything soupy. So for instance, if the kids will eat frijoles de la olla, you know, a pot of beans in its juice. So puree some onion, garlic, tomato, cilantro, and throw it in there. Or throw that same pureed veggie mix into the noodles. You know, if they're having mac and cheese, throw it in there instead of the water. Or, you know, if they're having fideo, instead of using nor, the powder, use the fresh pureed veggies, throw it into the chicken soup. So yeah, they're just gonna eat the chicken and they're just gonna eat the noodles, but hey, there's a secret sauce. The soup has, you know, pureed veggies. So there's that, there's hiding it. Um, I, ha I have a couple of teenager next door neighbors, they're 12 and 14, and they come over and hang out. And the other day I was making, I was craving meat and potato burritos. I just wanted a dang meat and potato burrito. And the girl, they, they live with their dad, single father. And so she does all the cooking. She's 14. She was telling me that she makes that, but her brother doesn't like vegetables. So I showed her how, you know, I did the meat and potatoes, but oh, there's also onion and garlic and celery and carrots uh, and zucchini. So by volume, it was about 50% non-meat and potato. It was all the other veggies. But then I also threw in, you know, like about a cup of salsa, one of my favorite salsas. And I had whole wheat tortillas. And so I fed the girl. She loved it. And then we sent some home for dad. He loved it. And then the boy who is like, no, I don't like veggies. He's like, okay, I'll try it. So then he tried it and he loved it. And speaking of the boy and dad, the data shows when I was um, in Oregon, we worked with the Kaiser um, Health Foundation and about childhood obesity among Latinos. And the data shows that 
the children will do what daddy does. Not what mommy says or what mommy does, but what daddy does. So if we can get daddy on board with a few changes, it's gonna be more influential in the household. And another change that I found really easy to implement in families that were not used to eating this way was to make, um, and this is in your recipes, a charola de bocadillos, you know, just like a, a snack tray that had sliced apples, cucumbers, nuts, carrots, maybe some peanut butter dip, or maybe even some ranch dip or just with lime and chili powder so that there's this beautiful tray of real food that's in the fridge. So when the kids get home from school and they look in there, they're like, oh, that looks good. And if it's presented in a way like it's for company, then they'll even like it more because it's forbidden fruit. So presenting fruit goes over easily. Um, as far as veggies, do it, offer it. If they say no, don't make a big deal. And ask them what they like. Because most kids like broccoli, carrots, a lot of kids like green beans. And if that's what they like, then that's what they can have. So those are a few tips I have to offer. Thank you, those were valuable. Um, so Michael Powell left a a compliment and a comment, but I think we can almost turn this into a question. Okay. Um, Michael Powell said, this is a fantastic presentation. Thank you. I would love to find a way to share this. So we'll definitely give you links to the recording um, for all of the attendees. Um, but he wants to share this with their partners in Alaska. So welcome all the way from Alaska. Wow. So what he said is, although we do not have all the Southwest plants and foods, we have many and have lots of equivalent options that our indigenous healers promote. And he said, keep up the great work. So I guess the question we can ask here is, I know that, you know, um, with your roots in the Southwest and, and on the, you know, the Mexico, New, Southwest New Mexico, Texas border, we talked a lot about, you know, a Mexican diet or a Mexican American diet. Can these foods almost be substituted or swapped out for something that was indigenous to, let's say, somebody's Latino from the Caribbean or from Brazil or from South America? Do the same rules apply? Of course. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and I'm not very familiar with, you know, I, I've had Cuban food and there's a, there are a lot of root vegetables in um, some of the Cuban food that I had. Um, so yeah, the, the principles are the same. Stick with lots of fruits and vegetables. Not so much of the root vegetables though. The starchy vegetables are the only one to, you know, kind of limit and have more of the above ground part of the vegetable. And then legumes and seeds and nuts. Yeah, so the principles of the Mediterranean diet are modifiable to any cultural tradition. Great. Okay. Especially for families that are immigrating here, right? And then our diets tend to change based on what we're now um, presented with as, as options and fast food becoming cheaper and cheaper, you know, yeah. um, more yeah. affordable for some families. Mm -hmm. Great. So Cynthia Martin um, is really excited about this presentation as a whole. And she's you know, wants to contact you after to find out if you do seminars. Um, she works with um, clinicians who work um, with serious mental illnesses, but she does have a question. Um, okay. Does taking lactase or lactose, I believe there's also a supplement for that, help with some of this um, lactose intolerance, or is it easier to just avoid lactose completely? So, um, Lactose intolerance is the most common understanding of foods of dairy sensitivity, but lactose is just the sugar and it ferments easily. And so it causes gases and bloating and, you know, immediate diarrhea in some people. And so taking lactase enzyme helps to prevent the symptoms of lactose maldigestion. However, casein, the protein in milk, is not aided, the digestion of casein is not aided with 
lactase, the enzyme that you buy. So um, there are some digestive enzymes a person can purchase that help to digest casein specifically. But my, I'm, I'm kind of a purist, and that is that if it irritates and inflames, then quit using it. And it doesn't have to be forever. Just quit using it for long enough for the tissue to regain its integrity. And then you can have it once in a while and maybe even use the enzymes so you don't get any sort of um, discomfort. But to actually allow the tissue to heal, remove the irritant completely for three to six to 12 months. It varies depending on how severely damaged one's intestinal lining is and how reactive one is because we end up producing antibodies to the foods. And when the antibody is triggered, it triggers an inflammatory response, not just locally, but systemically, which is why people who are sensitive to dairy tend to have more asthma, eczema, allergies. So it, it's doing things in places you wouldn't even imagine. So just, yeah, completely remove it for a while until your immune response is no longer triggered. Great answer, thank you. Um, so Renee Zach wants to know if there's any evidence that this will also help people who are quitting tobacco. Um, I didn't, I did not do any research specific to tobacco. However, I'm going to extrapolate here, and that is that some of the nutrients help reduce cravings. And so the craving isn't substance specific. The cravings tend to be um, opiate and dopamine receptors that have been, you know, triggered repeatedly by a substance and now they're empty. And um, let's see, tobacco binds must nicotinic receptors. I don't know. I, but the more, I just have so much faith, the more research I'm doing, I'm, I'm discovering that indeed a whole foods diet is a panacea. It allows us to get better from everything if we remove the cause and then provide our bodies with building blocks to heal our own self. Thank you for that. Thank you everybody for all of your questions, for your participation, for supporting the work that we do. Dr. Villalobos, can I have the next slide as we're wrapping up? Um, so here you will find the contact information for our parent organization, the National Latino Behavioral Health Association. Um, you can also reach out directly to Dr. Mancini, our project director, and to me, should you all have any questions, you will find our email addresses and actually our work phones here. Um, remember that at our website, which is listed right below the NALDBA website, in a few days, give us about a week, we will have a recording of this webinar along with the, the PDF copies of this presentation. And also Dr. Villalobos was so kind to share some recipes with everyone. So you'll find recipes in English and in Spanish. Um, next slide, please. And then here is the contact information for Dr. Villalobos. So for any of you who have, you know, maybe some more in-depth questions about what she presented today, those of you who want to find out if she's doing in any in-person seminars, you can definitely reach out to her. Um, next slide, please. So lastly, you know, again, we want to thank you so much for supporting our webinars. We're always looking to improve what we present to you, but also to pay attention to what our communities are asking for. Um, we would like to ask that you please take a few moments and to 
fill out our satisfaction evaluation. For those of you um, who choose to just get redirected afterwards, as soon as we end this webinar, you will be directed to the satisfaction evaluation. It does not take long at all. We do ask for some unique identifying information, um, but that is only to make sure that we have unique identifiers for those that we end up doing follow-up surveys for. We can compare um, responses. Your other option is if you have a smartphone with you, you can actually scan the QR code and fill out the survey that way. Dr. Villalobos, I wanna say thank you. Today's presentation was amazing. I learned so much. I took more notes than I've taken in a while. I appreciate you. We all appreciate you. And thank you, Maxine, and thank you, Ruth, and Victor, and Dr. Mancini, and thank you, Fred, for connecting me with this amazing group. It really is such an honor to help share information that hopefully will help people living with addictions and mental illness. It's, it's a dear place in my heart, folks living with that. I appreciate all your input, those who attest, uh, attended the webinar. Thank you so much, Dr. Villalobos. Thank you to our community. Hope to see you at our next event. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.